I'd been warned this is on now, so I better watch what I say. Oh, I can hear it. Oh, what a change it is seeing it like this. Uh, hello and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Christine Graham, MSP. I'm a Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to welcome you all here to our second science-themed Family Day. I hope you've already been enjoying yourself at the Inflatable Planetarium or the Sci-Fi uh, Roadshow or maybe just bouncing around on the Space Hoppers. I'm a bit old for that now. <laughs> I'm delighted that as part of this family day, you're able to join us at this very special festival of politics event with the brilliant Dr. Maggie Adrian Pocock, MBE. Uh, Dr. Adrian Pocock is a space scientist, if you don't know it, hello, yes. Um, a broadcaster, a science educator, and now the author of The Sky at Night, Book of the Moon, a wonderful and very accessible celebration of our unique neighbor, in the sky. As a young child, she dreamed of space travel to visit the Clangers. Who knows who the Clangers are? <laughs> Hands up if you know who the Clangers are. <laughs> wow, well, there we go. Can you make the Clanger noise? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> As most of you know, it's a children's TV series about mice-like creatures who lived on the moon. Perhaps Dr. Adder and Pocock would still be thrilled to hitch a ride on a NASA mission to space to see if there's any of those small, green, soup-loving creatures. <laughs> Dr. Adder and Pocock graduated with a BSc in physics and later a PhD in mechanical engineering from Imperial College London. She then went on to work for the Ministry of Defence on projects ranging from landmine detectors to missile warning systems before returning to her first love of building instruments to explore the wonders of space. She's worked on a host of high profile, big budget projects guaranteed to astonish any space fan. She was the lead scientist for the optical instrumentation group of, for Astrium and is working on the observation instruments for the, I'll get this wrong, Aeolus satellite oh, yeah, yes, that's right. oh, that's it. <laughs> to measure wind speeds as part of the investigation into climate change. Who knows about climate change? Hands up. Well, there we are. <laughs> oh, me too. <laughs> From groundbreaking work on the Gemini Observatory in Chile to the Hubble's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, Dr. Adair and Pocock is always leading on these exciting and amazing projects and innovations. Since 2014, she has co-presented the long-running astronomy TV programme, The Sky at Night. Who knows about The Sky at Night? Hands up. Oh, there we are. <laughs> and is a regular contributor on a TV comedy panel shows, Duck Quacks Don't Echo and Would I Lie to You? You, that's exciting. Was, oh, <laughs> forget the moon, Would I Lie to You? <laughs> Having taken her first steps at a time when Neil Armstrong took his first steps on the moon, Dr. Darren Pocock attended 13 schools during childhood and struggled with undiagnosed dyslexia for many years until a telescope making night class changed her world and a space scientist was born. Who knows what dyslexia is? Ah. Yes, it's trouble with... Oh, uh, spellings mainly. Trouble with spelling and reading words. So 13 schools, dyslexia, look at this wonderful person. So there's hope for us all, isn't there? You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> That's it. There's hope for us all. Partly because of her own experiences and because she's passionate about making science accessible to all, Dr. Darren Pocock has spoke to almost 30,000 school children <laughs> through her own company, Science Innovation Limited, inspiring them to chip away at the stereotypes of STEM subjects being the preserve of white males. What is a STEM subject? Oh, science, technology, engineering and maths. There you are, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maggie Adair and Pocock, invited to give a presentation all about what? The moon. What? The moon, yes. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I think I should introduce my friend. Um, this is um, Mooney. It, it's not a very original name, but this is Mooney. I don't know if everyone can see him. And um, my daughter, Lauren, who's sitting in the front there, she may heckle later. <laughs> um, she found him for me. And, um, uh, and uh, I think Mooney sums, up, m m sums me up, really. Because um, one of the reasons I wrote the book is mainly because this year is a very exciting year. Because this year is 50 years since we first stepped foot on the moon. So the words you'll be hearing a lot this year is, you know, one small step for man, 
<laughs> one giant leap for mankind. Because <laughs> that's the words that Neil Armstrong said as he stepped out on the moon. And he did that 50 years ago. So on the 20th of July this year, we'll be celebrating that and there should be all sorts of wonderful things happening. Now, um, the other reason I wrote the book is because my name is Dr. Maggie Adairon Pocock and I am a self-certified lunatic. Yes, it's embarrassing, but I do need to say it. And when I say I'm a lunatic, it's because I am mesmerised by the moon. Now, um, um, we've been up in Scotland um, for um, a few days now, because we flew up on Tuesday. And um, when, I, when we left uh, London, it was cold, it was wet, and it was horrible. And we flew up, and we landed in Glasgow, because we, we were doing some filming there. And it was beautiful, and it was sunny. And each time I see a nice clear day, I think, oh goodness, it might be clear tonight. And it was true, that night um, I looked out and there was the moon. And I must confess, I don't know if you two know about this, but that night I, I actually went outside at about one o'clock in the morning and I was just sort of looking at the moon like this. Ah. <laughs> and that's why I'm a lunatic. But what I want to do is I want to show you that each and every one of us should be lunatics because the moon does so much for us and we take it for granted. So yes, and, and with Mooney's help, I'm going to talk about the moon. So first of all, I think I should give you some of the basics about the moon. And to do that, I've got some props here. Now, this, as you might recognise, is the world. Now, um, if I look at the world, how big is the moon? So if this is Earth, then the moon is about this size. Now, let me put this piece of paper down. Now, that doesn't look very big. Oh, thank you. I'll need that back in a minute. It's my crib sheet. Now, it doesn't look very big, but our moon is one of the biggest compared to the, uh, its planet in the solar system. And this makes a lot of difference, and I'll, I'll explain uh, that as I go along. But so if this is the Earth, and this is the about the size of the moon, so um, the moon is uh, it's, it's quite a bit smaller, but it's, um, uh, it's of a, 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 a fair size. Now, life on the moon. When the first people went to the moon, they weren't too sure what to expect. Um, because um, the moon is sort of a, it's, it's a long way away from the Earth, and they weren't sure what to expect. Um, but as they analysed the moon, they did lots of uh, sort of orbits around the moon to try and find out you know, what it's made of, where would be a good landing site. Now, one of the first things that people notice about the moon is, I've got an image here, is the moon looks a bit like this. Now, can everybody see this? If I hold it up, and I, I pass it round, can everybody see? The moon is covered in craters. Now, this is quite interesting because it's very, very different from the Earth. If you look at sort of um, the planet Earth, you see oceans, you see land, but four-fifths of the Earth's surface is oceans. When you look at the moon, no oceans at all. Although these craters, when people first looked at the moon, they thought that these craters were full of water. And so um, the craters on the moon usually are called seas. They're, um, they're called uh, various, and they're given names of various seas. So looking at the moon, they saw the craters and they thought they were full of water. And it turns out there's not much water on the moon. But there is a little bit, but I'll talk about that later as well. So the moon is sort of a, 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 a fairly barren place, and it's got no atmosphere. And that's one of the reasons why we have all these craters. Because it hasn't got an atmosphere, here on the Earth, when a debris comes from space, um, um, it comes and it hits the Earth's surface. Uh, sorry, it hits the Earth's atmosphere, and it gets very hot as the friction as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere. Now, has anyone here seen a shooting star? OK, I see a few hands going up. Well, a shooting star, unfortunately, has nothing to do with stars whatsoever. Stars are massive. Our local star is the sun, and it sits at the centre of, um, of our solar system. Now, if you take planet Earth, planet Earth here, you can fit a million planet Earths into one sun. So if we had suns um, shooting through the atmosphere, that would be, it'd be very bad news for Earth. So what a shooting star actually is, it's a small piece of debris that's uh, left in space. And as it hits our atmosphere, it burns really brightly and it leaves a trail. And sometimes you get different coloured trails and from that trail you can see what that uh, meteorite is made out of. And actually when it hits the Earth, that's when it becomes a meteorite and that's when we pick it up. And actually I, told, I was told that actually there's, I think there's some meteorites downstairs. So if you go and look downstairs, you might see some meteorites. Okay, so that's a meteorite. Now, on the moon, it has no atmosphere. or It has something we call an exosphere, which is really, really, really thin atmosphere. So when things are hurtling through space, they just go plop and crash straight into the moon's surface. And that's what forms these craters. So the craters are formed by things from space hitting the moon. Now, the moon has had a hard time because it was formed about four and a half billion years ago. And in that time, it has been pummeled with various things from space. Now, here on Earth, if we, have, we do have a sort of big meteor craters. There's something called the Barringer Crater in Arizona, and it's about a mile wide. And it's where a huge meteor hit the Earth and made this huge crater. 
But most of the craters on Earth, because we have plate tectonics and we have weather, um, they get eroded away, so there's not much evidence of them. But on the Moon, because it has no plate tectonics, because it has very little weather, when you get a crater, it can stay there forever. So there's an idea that, you know, Neil Armstrong, as he stepped out on the moon, he left a footprint. There's no wind to take that away. There's nothing to, to erode that. The only thing that's going to take that away is a, a meteorite hitting that um, space. And if that happens, then that will be obliterated. But otherwise, things just stay on the moon's surface for billions of years. So the moon, in that way, is a time capsule. It shows us you know, what the early solar system was like. And so that's another reason why I'd love to go to the moon and investigate. So this is what the moon looks like, but it is sort of, it's been pummeled with um, um, all sorts of debris for many, many years. OK, so the moon, what would it be like to live on? Well, in the future, it would be lovely to have a moon base. But the moon is a, a sort of a very alien atmosphere. And it's alien because of two things. When people think of the moon, they think of it as quite cold. But the moon, uh, depending on what side of the moon you're on, if it's in the daytime side, then the radiation from the sun is hitting the moon. And the temperature of the moon goes up to 100 degrees. Now, ha who's had a, a cup of tea here and used boiling water? Yeah. <laughs> so boiling water, that's 100 degrees. And so that's the temperature on the moon's surface during the daytime. Now, daytime on the moon lasts about two weeks, and then you have two weeks of nighttime, and then the temperature plummets to minus 100. Now, that's colder than Antarctica. So uh, one day, it's, uh, one day, it's sort of like, oh, wow, it's a bit hot here, you know, 200 degrees C, and then the nighttime comes, whoa, it's freezing. Suddenly, you plunge down to minus 100 degrees C. So it gets very hot and very cold. And so when they sent astronauts to the moon, they had to sort of dress them appropriately so they could survive those extreme temperatures. And so I don't know if many of you have seen pictures like this. It's a picture of an astronaut on the moon, and he's wearing a big, bulky spacesuit. And they had to wear that because, A, um, the, the extreme temperature difference, and also I mentioned that there has no atmosphere. We are surrounded here on Earth by a wonderful atmosphere where it allows us to breathe and sort of run around and do all sorts of things. On the moon, there is no atmosphere, there's no oxygen, there's nothing we can breathe. And so they have to wear a big buggy spacesuit to protect them from the, uh, the temperature range, but also to provide an environment where they can breathe and they can survive as humans. So a life on the moon looks like fun, but it would be pretty challenging. So that's what, um, uh, that's what they did. They sent, um, so 50 years ago, they sent the first people to the moon. So I, I mentioned that I'm a lunatic, and sort of the, uh, the lunar landscape is pretty, um, is pretty, uh, pretty hostile. I think that's the best way to describe it. And so, um, uh, yes, so one of the other questions is, so has anyone seen the moon changing shape? Uh, maybe, maybe some of the kids, yeah, have you seen the moon changing shape? So what sort of shape does it have? Can you tell me? Yeah, crescent half and full, perfect. Now, I've got another poster here, if I can find the right one. It's probably this one on the floor. Let's have a look. Yes. Is that the right way around? No, it's not. Let's go this way. So you mentioned crescent half and full. So that's some of the phases of the moon. Now, I'll just show that round. Now, I think people are familiar with the phases of the moon. Now, but why do we get them? Does anyone know? Do you know? What do you, what do you think? The sun is reflecting to the light on the moon, and the sun is not reflecting to the dark part of the moon. Yes. And so if I take Moonie here, now imagine that you guys are the sun. So now, um, this is the moon, and I'm going to be the Earth. Now, if the moon is here, the sunlight is coming in this way, and I'm looking at the moon this side. So this side of the moon is all lit up, but I'm on this side of the moon, so I only see the dark side of the moon. Uh, so, um, uh, so this side is, is, this is in the nighttime side of the moon, so this is what I see. So this is what we call a new moon, where you don't see the moon in the sky at all. And I hate that face because I can't see the moon and I get quite upset. Okay, let's go for the other extreme. Now, you're still the sunlight, the sunlight's coming in here, um, this is the moon here, and now the sunlight is hitting the moon and I'm looking at the moon. So I'm looking at the bright side of the moon. So this phase of the moon is a full moon. But now let's say the moon's over here. Now, I'm, I'm here, the moon's here, and the sunlight's coming in this way. So this is the lit side of the moon, and I'm seeing half of that lit side. So I'm seeing half of the moon's disk, well, quarter of the moon's disk, actually. But um, I'm seeing this side of the moon lit up. So that's why we get the different phases. It depends on where the sunlight's coming in, where the Earth is relative to the moon. And so we get all these different phases. Now, if you think about it, if you're the sun, and this is the moon, and I'm the Earth, this is actually what we call a solar eclipse because the moon should be in front of the sun and then, um, um, so um, uh, the sun, sorry, the moon's in front of the sun, so that should be a solar eclipse. But has anyone here seen a total solar eclipse? Ah, um, were you impressed? 
Were you impressed when you saw it? Yes, yes, you were. Okay, um, actually, because I saw um, a total solo eclipse and it blew my socks off. The first time I saw a total solo eclipse, I had to sit down afterwards because I was so blown away and my mind was sort of, whoa, that was amazing. Because what you see is the sun disappear behind the moon. And all you see around is you see the bright corona of the sun. That's the outer atmosphere of the sun beaming out into space. And so you see this dark disk and then all this light streaming off the sun. And then as the moon moves on in its orbit, um, what you do is you get the diamond ring effect where a bright ray of light springs out from the sun and you see this diamond, um, diamond ring effect and then the moon goes on. Now, a total eclipse of the sun only lasts a few minutes, but you'd think and, and with all the alignment, you could get a total eclipse of the sun every month as the moon goes around the Earth because it takes about a month for the moon to go around the Earth. But the thing is, you don't get that because the sun and the moon and the Earth are in a perfect alignment. They're about five degrees off. So sometimes the moon is too high to eclipse the sun. Sometimes the moon is too low to eclipse the sun. So that's why you don't get a total eclipse every month. But every few years, and I think the next one is coming up, the next one is coming up later on this year in a place where I used to work in Chile. So I'm really looking forward to going out and seeing that if I can. Because um, we went out as a family in 2017 to see um, the total eclipse of America, it was called. Because it was a total eclipse that went across America. And we started right at the beginning in um, Oregon and saw it there. And it was an amazing thing to see. So that's eclipses of, of the moon. And you also, so that's eclipses of the sun, a solar eclipse. But you also get eclipses of the moon, where the Earth gets between the sun and the moon. And the moon disappears for a while. But the moon doesn't just disappear. What happens is the moon goes blood red. Now, has anyone here seen a lunar eclipse? Ah, oh, now you've seen one. Um, did it freak you out? <laughs> it was, yeah. Well, see, I saw one, and a total eclipse of the moon, because the moon literally goes red. And you can imagine ancient people, you know, looking back in time, sort of looking up and, whoa, yeah, okay, the moon's red. We're doomed. I don't care what's happening. We're doomed. But it happens because, and what happens is, um, the Earth gets between, um, so the, and this is the moon, and the, uh, on the Earth, and the Earth gets between the sun and the moon. And so light can't get through the Earth, and so the moon should just go disappear. But what actually happens, because the Earth's got an atmosphere, some of the light from the sun goes through the Earth's atmosphere, and as that light goes through the Earth's atmosphere, some of the blue light gets scattered out, so it's only the red light reaching the moon, and so that's why the moon goes blood red. Now, um, a total eclipse of the sun only lasts a few minutes. A total eclipse of the moon lasts a few hours. So if you get a chance to see one, do check it out, because it's pretty freaky. <laughs> OK, that tells you a bit about the moon. But one of the things that I'm interested in also is something called archaeoastronomy, which is a bit of a mouthful. But you know, you've heard of archaeology and you've heard of astronomy. Well, archaeoastronomy is just a merging of the two. So it's looking back in the past and seeing how people have celebrated the moon. And lots of people have been fascinated by the moon. And I've, I've mentioned a few of them here. Now, one of the women that I'm, I'm, I, f I was fascinated about was the, a woman who lived uh, 4,000, I think 4,000 years ago. And her name was Et Hedu Anna. And she was the chief moon goddess in the city of Babylon. Now, see, to me, that is a great title. I would like to be, actually, if you don't mind, I'd, well, actually, no, I'd like to be chief moon goddess All of the right. city of Edinburgh. So if, and, if and that could be arranged. Like chief moon goddess. <laughs> uh, there you are. You're, oh, you're officially that, though. <laughs> And so I think it's an amazing title. But her name was the first female name to be written in the history books. And it's quite interesting because we can find pictures of her and we can find busts of her. And if you find, so we found these ancient busts of her and we looked at them and there was something a bit odd because we found pictures and they were named, they had her name on it, but she had a beard. And we thought, hey, what's going on here? And it turned out that because she was speaking to many of her male colleagues to show that she had sort of, you know, she was a sort of a, an important woman, she used to have to wear a beard. Now, I do a, this television programme called The Sky at Night every month, and it's been going on. It's the longest running television series in the world, and I've never had to wear a beard yet. <laughs> so I think we've come a long way in 4,000 years, but it's quite interesting that she used to have to wear a beard. So this was an amazing woman, and it's sort of celebrated. And one of the things I love about her is she used to write poetry, and she used to write poetry about the moon, and she used to write poetry about astronomy, and her poems live on today. People sort of read these poets, and they, they sort of um, study these, this poetry from 4,000 years ago. But yeah, her title, um, Moon Goddess of the City of Babylon. 
Now, and so I'm looking at people, and I've investigated people, but I'm also investigating places. And one of the places that really caught my eye as a celebration of the moon, because um, people hear about places like Stonehenge and, sort of a, and various other places that celebrate the sun, but there are many, many, many places that celebrate the moon, and many of them are up here in Scotland. And one of the places um, that I'm most interested in, and I wrote about, is somewhere called Warren Fields. Now, Warren Fields was only um, discovered in 2013, and it's up in Aberdeenshire, and it is a series of pits that run, I think, a, a track of 50 kilometres. And each one of these pits is one of the phases of the moon. Now, when people worked out um, when these pits were actually dug, they were dug 8,000 years ago. So this is going back 8,000 years, and people dug these pits over a track of 50 kilometres. Now, as I say, each pit represents a phase of the moon, but also, um, if you look at the winter solstice, this, the alignment of these pits also aligns up with the winter sol solstice. Now, 8,000 years ago, people here were nomadic. They weren't sort of, a, they were hunter gatherers, they were moving around. And so the fact that they took time to build these pits shows that they wanted to celebrate the moon and understand the moon. So if you go back in time, you can see that people across the world have wanted to understand the moon. And they did this because the moon is like a timekeeping piece. I mean, back in those days, they didn't have you know, digital watches, funnily enough, but they needed to keep track of time. And they had, you can have the sun, but the sun, sort of, you can map the sun over a period of a year. The moon is really convenient because you can map the, the phases of the moon over a period of a month. And a month is sort of quite a handy unit of time. And so they were looking at and understanding the phases of the moon to try and keep track of time, to try and see you know, when the seasons were going to change, when, the, when to plant things, when to do things. And so I think this was sort of a moving people from sort of a, a hunter-gatherers to actually sort of a people who were sort of Cecil, who stayed in one place. You, looking at the moon helped them do that because they understood the phases of the moon and they understood the passage of time. Now, um, actually, oh, I've got a poem. One of the other things that people have done is they've just looked and, and just like me, they are, uh, we have many fellow lunatics out there. People have looked up at the moon and they've wondered about the moon and they've written stories about the moon, but people have written some amazing poetry about the moon. Now, I, I can't do the poem here, but there's a, uh, a, a poem called Child Moon and it's by a chap called Carl Sandberg. And he's an American poet, and he wrote about a little girl looking up at the moon as sort of a, um, a, a, out of her window. And it's, she looks up at the moon, and she sees the beauty of the moon. And then she, she, she falls asleep, you know, saying, you know, oh, moon, moon, as she goes to sleep. So if you get a chance to read the poem, it, it is truly beautiful. But there are many, many beautiful poems about the moon. And so people are celebrating the moon in all sorts of different ways. Now, yes, one of um, the uh, other interesting things is I love science fiction. I think there's a science fiction exhibition here. So I might go and check that out later, but I love science fiction. Um, I'm dyslexic, so I always found reading hard. And one of the things I did as a child, I started reading science fiction. And when you start off reading, it's all about you know, Peter and Jane and sort of very pretty dull stuff. <laughs> but when I started reading science fiction, I thought, oh, wow, this stuff is worth reading. And so that's, I think, science fiction really helped me sort of get established because of sort of reading science fiction, they were stories worth reading. And so one of the things I was interested in is trying to find out, you know, which were the first science fiction stories about the moon. And um, there, was, um, there is a, a sort of an ancient Greek, um, the first science fiction stories are written by an, an ancient Greek philosopher who talks about a whirlwind sort of picking people up and taking them to the moon. But one of my favourite stories is a, by, about a chap called um, uh, Wan Hu. And Wan Hu is a bit of a legend because Wan Hu was a Chinese um, 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 bureaucrat and he lived in China, and he kept on looking at the moon, and sort of think, oh, yeah, the moon. And so he did this. And um, uh, one day, he decided that he's going to go and visit the moon. So this was our first um, ast potential astronaut. And so what he did is he actually got um, his minions to put fireworks onto his chair. And so they strapped lots of fireworks. I would not recommend this. No one try this at home. <laughs> but this is what he did. He got his minions to put lots of fireworks on his chair. And he sat in his chair, and then he said, OK, light them. And so the minions came forward, you know, lit the touch paper, ran you know, as far as they could. And there was... <laughs> and then there was a large explosion. <laughs> and Wan Hu wasn't there any longer. Now, the question is, did he make it to the moon? <laughs> I can see some people sort of shaking their heads. It seems unlikely. Well, the unlikely answer is he did. Not through the rockets, though. Because I don't, we don't know if this story is true or not. But... Um, People have been speaking about this story for many, many years. And as a result, when people first started orbiting the moon and seeing the craters of the moon, they named one of the craters of the moon after him. So there is a crater on the moon named Wan Hu. So he did make it to the moon, but not technically. <laughs> 
but, um, and, and I think there's um, a couple more people I'd like to mention. Another person uh, who was a poet, a Chinese poet called Lai Po. Now, Lai Po is a guy directly after my own heart because um, he used to write poems about the moon. And, and, one, and one of his poems is just very simple. It's about four lines. And it says, you know, I sit here drinking and I salute the moon and we drink together. Now, I've done that because I'm a lunatic and so I do that sort of thing. But I was working out in a telescopes in Chile and I was on my own for about six months. And I used to get a, you know, a glass of Chilean wine, which is very good wine. And I used to sit there with the moon and we'd sort of toast together and we'd drink together. So um, that's one of the things I did with the moon. But Lai Po wrote this poem uh, probably sort of um, um, 2,000 years ago. But Lai Po was definitely a lunatic because I think one day he'd actually drunk a little bit too much wine and someone was rowing him across the river to take him home. And he saw the reflection of the moon in the water. And he, oh, it's the moon. And he reached out to see the moon and he fell in the water and drowned. So, <laughs> so be careful. Be a lunatic, but not too much of a lunatic. <laughs> Okay, so that sort of covers some of the, the amazing things, the ways we've celebrated the moon in the past. And, and, the, and we've talked a little bit about, about you know, what the moon's made up of and you know, so how, um, how it works. And, but um, one of the things is that really interests me is the moon in the future. Will we um, actually put up your hands here? How many people here would like to make a trip to the moon? Okay, I'd say, I'd say that's sort of, a, I think that that's probably about 50%. And so, and, and actually, I should be. <laughs> I would definitely love to go to the moon. Um, it's been sort of my dream. It's been a, actually literally a dream for me. I remember having a dream as a child, and I was sort of a. I, I was. Um, I had a nice hot bath, and I put on a bathrobe, and I stepped out, and I looked out of the window, and I could see the Earth. It's like this picture. Ooh, where is it? This picture. I could see the Earth rising around the moon, and this is a picture that is called Earthrise, and it's one of the first. It was a picture of the Earth. Sorry. I to hold it. Can I hold it like this? It's a picture of the Earth rising behind the moon. And this is the image I saw in my dream. And since then, I've always wanted to go out there. But this image is quite interesting in another way because it's a powerful image. When we first went out to the moon and we started taking photographs, um, um, when we first went out into space, we suddenly saw the Earth more like this. When we're living on the Earth, we sort of run around its surface, and you know, ah, yeah, we're all very busy and all doing lots and lots of things. But it isn't until we saw the Earth like this that we realise what's truly going on. Because when you see the Earth like this, you see the Earth as vulnerable. You see it as a, a point in space. We see it as a, a, something that should be nurtured. And some people believe that by seeing images like this, people were inspired to actually protect the Earth. The environmental movement is, is thought to be partly responsible by, from pictures like this. Because suddenly we saw the, um, the Earth as a, a sort of a, a small sort of a blue entity in space rather than just the thing we live on. So the, um, the moon can inspire so many different things and it can inspire things like this. So my dream is to one day get to the moon myself. And um, it's, a, it's a crazy dream, but I, I love crazy dreams because I think crazy dreams take you further than you ever think po is possible. So my crazy dream is one day to get to the moon. But will we do it? Well, I think we went to the moon and landed on the moon 50 years ago. And it's about 45 years since the last people sort of left the moon and sort of traveled back to Earth. That was 1972. So it's a while ago since we've actually been to the moon. But when will we all get the opportunity to go to the moon? Well, I think we're in a new era of the moon because in the past it was about sort of um, so it was about dominance. Oh, yeah, showing you I'm better than you, and I can I can I can reach the moon, and, and it was all about the space race, you know, the Russians against the Americans, showing who was sort of the dominant power. And now we're actually going through a sort of an era of collaboration where many people are going to the moon. I don't know if you heard, I think yesterday or the day before, um, there was a, an Israeli uh, moon probe, a lunar probe, that unfortunately crashed into the lunar surface. But more and more countries are getting interested in the moon. And, but also, it's not just companies. Um, the people who crashed into the moon, they were a commercial company. And I think it's commerce that is going to get us to the moon. And I like to compare it with things like computers and mobile phones and actually um, flights. When people first started flying across the world, it was the great and the good. It was you know, sort of, you know, the starlet with the chihuahua you know, hopping onto an aeroplane. It was only the famous people that flew across the world. But slowly but surely, things have changed, and more and more of us. And so I, I think well, we didn't actually fly up EasyJet, but now we're living in the EasyJet era, where most people can fly anywhere because flights have become cheaper. So why did that happen? 
Well, it was demand. We wanted to travel across the world. And so when there's commerce and there's demand, people will actually meet the demand and flights and things like that get cheaper. You can see the same with mobile phones. The first mobile phones were sort of, you know, whoa, they're huge. And you know, only sort of, you know, a few business people had mobile phones because, you know, um, they, only, they were the only people who could afford them. But slowly but surely, um, um, people, um, phones got cheaper and cheaper. And now so, you know, I've got you know, my mobile phone in my pocket. And yeah, supposedly, this has more processing power uh, than the things that took people to the moon. So, um, it, with demand, and commu computers as well. The first computers were the size of this chamber. But now we've got sort of, a, sort of more computing power in this than the computers we had earlier. And that's because there was a demand. People wanted it, and so the price came down. And so I think as many of us want to go to the moon, in the future, the price should come down. We have our first space tourists you know, sort of traveling into space, and they're paying sort of virtually millions to get out there. But given time, I think that the price will come down. And so maybe um, sort of the young ones in the audience will be making regular trips to the moon and sort of living out on the moon and um, sort of having fun on the moon. So I think there is a future for all of us out there. And why go to the moon? Well, there's so many things we can do out there. I mean, there's a great astronomy to be done on the moon, radio astronomy, um, sort of um, um, visible astronomy. That would be great on the moon. And that's my dream, to have a, a visible telescope on the moon in one of the dark places that never see the sunlight. That would be my ideal job. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it. It's a bit expensive. <laughs> but um, other things on the moon. In the future, as we get sort of a less power here on Earth, maybe we'll want to use the moon to actually provide us with power on Earth. And there's one idea that you could actually, out of the moon um, soil, you could make solar panels and you can put these solar panels on the moon's surface. They'll get two, um, two weeks of constant daylight and then you can beam that power back down to Earth well, via microwaves. So we could use the moon to power the Earth in the future. But at the same time, uh, we can mine the moon for all sorts of, um, um, sort of elements in the future. But at the same time, there's a question to be asked. Should we be doing this? Is it ethically correct? Because it, it rather feels to me as if we've had a wild party here on Earth. Yeah, woohoo! We get burn all the resources. Yeah, oh no, we're running out. Where do we go next? Hey, the moon! So should we be looking for the moon, or should we be solving our own problems and looking at how to have a, 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 a future here on Earth where we look after our resources rather than just going further out and looking for somewhere else to mine? So I think these are the questions that we're going to be answering. And it's the young people that will be having to face the consequences of, of these decisions. So I think each and every one of us should be looking to the moon. So the moon does so much for us. I mean, it gives us tides. But effectively, I think the moon created life here on Earth by creating a, a chemical called RNA, which is the key precursor to DNA. So without the moon, I don't think we'd even be here. So I think each and every one of us should be lunatics because the moon does so much for us, we take it for granted. But the best thing to do is just look at it and admire it. Thank you very much. Well done. Well, it, it's your turn now to ask questions. So if you want to ask a question, just put your hand up and the microphones in front of you, a little red band will come on. And that will be you live, so watch what you say. <laughs> and uh, so who wants to ask a question? Come on. Oh, I can see a hand up over there. That, so there you are. A, little boy, you want to stand up so we can see you? Oh, there you go. What's your name? Ooh, is the microphone, is the microphone? It's, it's, it's on, but you need to stand next go to it. Go in front of it. That's you. Thank you. What's your name? Joshua. Joshua. What's your question, Joshua? How far away is the moon? How far away is the moon? Now, see, I'm dyslexic, so I don't remember numbers, but I have a handy crib sheet here, and I can tell you exactly how far away it is. So, hold it, let me just see. Um, um, if you talk amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> because, um, see, because of my dyslexia, sometimes numbers come out wrong, and I want to get this right, so let me see if I can find it. And, and, unless anyone else knows offhand. But it's... If you wanted to travel to the moon, it would take about three days to get there. So... Um, Although um, the, um, um, uh, the Israeli probe took a lot longer because it took a scenic route. Sorry, let me just get to my... While, while we're searching that, who's got another question in the pipeline? Right, I'll, just, I'll come to you next in grey, lady in grey. Okay, actually, well, do you want to tell me and your question you while, I, while I... Right, this what, if you want to ask your question, wait till the red... That's a, in grey in the middle here, I'm pointing. Can you see, is your red light come on? Is it, is it come on? No. Oh, crumbs. Oh, maybe because that light's up. I'll need to wander over. Over here. Is it come up? Oh! <laughs> that was a tumble. Right, there you are. You can, you can ask your question. Oh, 
You can ask your question now. What's your name? Erica. Erica, there's your question. I'll try Please. not to fall over again. Right. Erica, what's your question? Can you swim in the sea? No. Mm -hmm. On the moon. <laughs> so can you swim in the sea on the moon? Well, first of all, let me answer your question. And your question is, so the answer is, the moon is on average, and I'll need to explain the average, two, um, 239,000 miles away. Okay, it's quite far. But I need to qualify that because that's on average. Because, um, um, so now let's say, um, um, if, if my hand is the earth and this is the moon, people usually think that the moon goes around the earth in a circular orbit, but it doesn't. The moon actually goes around in an orbit which is slightly squished. Everything that orbits, so um, the earth's orbit around the sun is a squished circle called an ellipse. And so it means that sometimes the moon is closer to the Earth and sometimes the moon is further away from the Earth, depending on where in the ellipse it is. And so it's on average about 300,000 miles, but sometimes it's a bit closer and sometimes it's a bit further away, depending on where it is in its orbit. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Now, Erica. Can you, yeah, now, Eric, can you swim in the moon seas? The answer is no. <laughs> but you see, in the past, we thought that the moon was really, really dry and there was no water on the moon. But there is some water, not enough to swim in seas, but there is water. And uh, the water is mainly at the poles, because I, I, I mentioned very briefly that uh, in, there's some areas of the moon where the craters are so deep and, um, in, in the northern regions or the southern regions where the sunlight doesn't actually get into the craters. Now, any chemicals that go into those holes, they are some of the coldest places in the solar system because the moon is pretty cold anyway, and without the sunlight, um, th those, those places are just incredibly cold. And so any water vapour that we're whiffing past that goes into those holes, the water will collect there, and we can find ice water on the moon. Now, this is really important, because if we want to live in the moon in the future, water is one of the critical things we'll need, because water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is rocket fuel, but oxygen is what we need to breathe. And so to have a self-sustaining sort of a colony on the moon, we need to be able to tap into that water, break it down into hydrogen and oxygen, and then we'll have um, sort of a, um, an environment, we'll be able to create environments like sort of a, in um, sort of domes and things like that, where we can use that water, break it down into oxygen, and we'll have a breathable atmosphere. So rather than ferrying things up from Earth, which is incredibly expensive, because the Earth is so big and it has such a huge gravity, getting things off the Earth's surface is, is really hard work. And so, to, um, but if we can find water on the moon, it's gonna be really helpful. Now, there was one um, sort of, um, we looked at the amount of water that we found on the moon, and many of the orbiters that go around the moon, they look for signs of water. And if you actually took all the water on the moon and you were able to melt it, you'd probably get, um, um, sort of, you'd get a puddle which covered the whole of the moon's surface, which was about sort of a half a metre deep. So unfortunately, this, all this is, is sort of in little pockets and it's sort of in, in, in the actual, so, um, in the lunar soil. So you can't swim in the seas, but there is water on the moon. So if you did go and live there as a colonist, you could probably have a swimming pool. <laughs> and there was a question <laughs> up there. Yes, um, can you, oh, watch myself here. Is your red light come on? Yes. Good, good. Oh, we're making progress. <laughs> What's your name? Ross. Ross, go for it, Ross. Hello, Ross. How big is the moon? How big is the moon? Well, if this is Earth, this is the moon. So um, it's sort of significantly, I can check the time, I can give you the facts and figures, but I always have to check them because I'm going to get them wrong. So what I should tell you is um, the Earth, um, sorry, the moon, uh, where is it? Sorry, next page. Because uh, the moon is sort of um, uh, significantly smaller than the Earth, but its diameter is, axial tilt, rotation, distance from Earth, uh, diameter is 2,159 miles uh, in diameter. So from this side to this side, that is its diameter. And you see, but compared with the Earth, um, the uh, moon is, uh, is about 27% of the Earth's diameter. So it's significantly smaller. Um, so, um, uh, so yes, that, that is the actual diameter of the moon. And, um, but because it is smaller, it has uh, less gravity. So I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of people walking on the moon, but you know, they sort of go, whoa. <laughs> and they have that sort of really funny gait. And it's because the moon has less mass, and so it has less gravity. And so when you're on the moon, if you jump on the Earth, um, the, the, uh, the sort of force you need to do a one meter jump on the Earth, if you did the same jump on the moon, you'd jump about 1.6 meters. So on the, um, on the moon, it should be a lot of fun. And um, th there are some, um, some videos of um, some of the astronauts playing golf on the moon's surface. 
And there's one guy who uses, I think, an eight iron, and he sort of just swacks the ball, and he sees it, and he says, look at it traveling miles and miles and miles. And um, it, it literally did. It traveled about 2.8 miles when he whacked it on the moon's surface. Because the moon is so much smaller, and there's less gravity, and there's no air resistance. This ball just went... And I think it was traveling for about a minute and a half before it actually landed on the moon's surface. So golf on the moon could be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, well, all the whole sea of hands now. I'll give you numbers. So I'm coming to one, then two, then where's three? Three. Anybody else? Four. <laughs> Remember your numbers. And I called five. Oh, six, seven, eight, Whoa. nine. <laughs> right? Ooh. You all know your numbers. Good. Number one. Who is that? My That's lady my in red, red light on. Yeah. Right. My what? name is Ashrita. My question is, can we fly on the moon? So can we fly on the moon? Can we fly on the moon? Unfortunately, no. Because to fly here on Earth, we need the Earth's atmosphere. We need the sort of, you know, this gas surrounding us. Because we're held up by sort of um, the air pressure. Uh, and on the moon, because it has virtually no atmosphere at all, we couldn't fly that way. So, um, because you know, even helicopters and all those things, they need the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere to keep us up there. So on the moon, we can't. So if you walk on the moon and sort of jump on the moon, it might feel a little bit like flying. But if, if you wanted to take a helicopter there or anything like that, you couldn't... And it's quite interesting because um, recently we've been trying to land probes on Mars. Now, Mars is sort of a, um, bigger than the moon, but it's smaller than Earth. And Mars has a, an atmosphere around it, but it's quite a thin atmosphere. And so when we actually land things on the Martian surface, we need to find ways of slowing them down because they were zooming through space, whoosh, 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 through space, and then they get into orbit around Mars, and then we want them to land on the surface. Now, here on Earth, we have air resistance. And if you see um, um, sort of uh, meteorites, uh, I mentioned sort of meteorites sort of coming down to Earth, or meteors coming down to Earth, or if you see um, spacecraft um, capsules coming to Earth, they heat up in the Earth's atmosphere, and that friction slows them down. In Mars, it's got a thin atmosphere, so the moon has no atmosphere, so that wouldn't work at all. You just go splat into the surface. And so you need other ways of sort of slowing yourself down. Um, but um, on Mars, it has a bit of atmosphere, and so they have to find ways of using sort of really huge parachutes and sort of jetpacks, effectively, on the Martian probes so they can land on the surface gently. And unfortunately, on Mars, it's really uh, quite embarrassing, but 50% of our landers hit the surface too hard and go smash. And um, uh, every so often, you see footage of, you know, sort of, a, um, or, or you see sort of um, the pictures of where another Martian uh, probe has landed on the surface and gone smash. So it's all to do with the atmosphere. And unfortunately, the moon hasn't got enough atmosphere to hold anything up in the air. No flying on the moon, I'm afraid. Number two, <laughs> who's number two? That's the lady there with the glasses. Have you, is your light come on? Oh, yeah, your light's on, perfect. Good. My name is Kayu, and my question is, is the moon hot or cold? So it depends on where you are. During the daytime, the moon gets incredibly hot, about 100 degrees. So if you're making a cup of tea and you boil the kettle, that is 100 degrees. And you know, if you, that would really hurt, wouldn't it? So you wouldn't want to touch it. That is the temperature of the daytime on the moon. But at nighttime, so you get two weeks of daytime um, when the moon is blasted by the sun. Then during the lunar night time, uh, the temperature plummets to minus um, sort of 100 degrees. And it's sort of really, really cold. And so um, and then, and then that's quite, quite challenging. So anyone who's going to live on the lunar surface in the future, they'd have two weeks of daytime, two weeks of nighttime, but the temperature change between them would be vast, uh, um, bigger than Antarctica. And so um, we need to ha develop sort of uh, houses and things like that where people can survive those temperature range and also spacesuits where you can live comfortably and sort of run around the moon's surface, but they will protect you from those huge temperature ranges. So the moon is both hot and cold, but um, uh, yes, um, uh, it's um, uh, uh, pretty challenging either way, I think. Sounds and worse you. than Scotland. That's <laughs> a change. Uh, where's number three? And who's number four? Who's number four? Where's three? Who was oh, four? Got three. Okay. Oh, four, four, was four was here. Just remember, I forget numbers, okay. you see, so you're number four. Number three, where are you? We're back, to, we're back to you, yes. Uh, oh, no, no, please say your question. Yeah, say, say your question. Come on, darling, say your question. Uh, <laughs> I think you. Does the moon change any other colours apart from red and why? That's yes. a good one. That is a very good question. One of the things I was quite interested in is now, 
I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see the moon when it's low on the horizon. So sometimes you see it when it's up here in the sky, but if you see it low on the horizon, it looks very different. Now, a while ago, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I've got your question. A while ago, I was looking at the moon, and it was low on the horizon, and it looked really orange. And in fact, it looked so orange, I couldn't believe it was the moon. And as I'm looking at it, you're like, what, is that really the moon? Uh, and so it was low on the horizon. Now, when it's low on the horizon, what you're seeing is the moon, and the moon itself doesn't change colour, but the light coming from the moon is coming through the Earth's atmosphere. Mm. Now, when it's low on the horizon, it travels through more of the Earth's atmosphere than when it's directly above us, what we call it zenith. And when it's doing that, the blue light, again, gets scattered, and so the moon looks more orange. Mm. And so, um, but then when it's up here, it looks its usual sort of you know, pale, sort of, you know, bluey, yellowy colour. But there's also something called a blue moon. Has anyone here heard of that? A blue moon. You've heard of a blue moon? You heard people say, yeah, ah, once in a blue moon. Well, I've, all, I've looked at the moon for many, many years because I'm a lunatic, but I've never seen the moon go uh, the colour blue. Now, a blue moon is actually a, a phenomena, and it's a phenomena when you actually get two full moons in one month. And that actually happened this year. In January this year, we got two full moons because we got one very early in January and then one in late January. So you get two full moons in one month. That is considered to be a month with a, a blue moon. But then if that happens in January, then February has no full moon at all. And then March, again, has two full moons. So that's what happened this year. We had two full moons in January, no full moons in February, and two full moons in March. And, so, and this doesn't happen very often, maybe once every sort of three or four, five years. And so blue moons are quite rare, but they're a bit like buses. Um, you <laughs> wait for them to come along, and then two come along at once. So <laughs> blue moons, that's what you, but the moon doesn't change colour at all. So you can get a red moon during a total eclipse, you can get a sort of a yellowy moon or an orangey moon when it's low on the horizon, but the, you, you never actually get a blue moon. A blue moon is just a phenomena where you get two moons in one month. But thank you very much for your question. Question four. Wait, is the red light on? Ah, on. there it goes. There it goes. Um, my name's Savannah, and me and my big sister have the ex same question. So, you know how the other planets in the solar system have their own moons? Yeah. So, does the moon have its own moon? Ah, does the moon have its own moon? Yeah. Our moon doesn't have any moons around it. And it's quite interesting. We don't believe that moons, we haven't, I don't think we've found any moons that have their own moons. But we have found asteroids. So um, if you think of the solar system, you've got you know, the sun at the centre, a big, bright, bright, and then if you move further out, you've got sort of a, a Mercury, a Venus, Earth, and then you get something called the asteroid belt. And in the asteroid belt, you get lots of sort of um, lumps of rock, which sort of, uh, sometimes you get sort of dwarf planets, which are about you know, the size of Pluto, so quite small. But then you get sort of you know, tiny, tiny little sort of um, little rocks. A and it's funny that some of these tiny asteroids actually have moons going around them. And there's actually an asteroid out there that has two moons. So this is something that is smaller than our moon, but it actually has moons going around it. So um, we don't believe... Uh, uh, quite another interesting place is Saturn. Saturn, I think, has something of the order of sort of 62 moons going around it. But it also has something called moonlets. And it's se it seems that these moonlets are what guide um, the, um, the rings around Saturn. Because you know, Saturn is the planet with the huge rings around it. Well, it's these moonlets that actually keep those uh, rings in place. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we have sort of uh, many, many, many moons out there in the solar system. But none are, are quite, is quite as good as ours. Because our moon, compared with our planet, is very, very large. Um, if you look at uh, planet Mars, Mars has two moons, but um, they're really diddy, <laughs> and one looks like a potato and one looks like a pebble, so <laughs> and they're really quite small. And I think the, see, it's quite interesting because um, where do these moons come from? So we think the moons of Mars, because Mars is next to the asteroid belt, we think that sort of, yeah, an asteroid was sort of bumbling along one day, whoa, it got caught in the gravitational pull of Mars, and so that's how Mars got its moons. But the Earth moon is too big for that to happen, so there is a question as, as to where our moon came from. Mm. And there are all sorts of different theories. And the, the most common theory is our moon was formed when a planet about the size of Mars crashed into Earth about you know, four and a half billion years ago. Yeah, crash. You know, and it sort of, effectively, it, sort of, um, it smashed Earth up. And all this sort of debris sort of from, from this um, Mars-like planet we call Thea uh, hit the Earth, and it sent all this debris up into space. And this debris was around the Earth, and it slowly clumped together. We call it coalescing. It coalesced to form the moon. But when the moon formed, it was much, much closer to Earth. And so, you know, I like looking at the moon. I see the moon. In the early Earth, four and a half billion years ago, the moon would have been massive in the sky because it was so much closer. But slowly but surely, it's spiralling away from us. 
So to get back to your question, the moon doesn't have any moons. We don't know of any other moons in our solar system that has moons, but there are some asteroids that do have moons, which is a bit surprising because they're pretty diddy. <laughs> thank you for your question. Question Both five, you. where's five? <laughs> oh, five, thank you. Five. Are you five, are you? Good, I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> You, that's your light. Just give us your name and your question. My name is Sai. Why is there little water on the moon? Why is there so little water on the moon? Well, it's about, I think it all comes back to this atmosphere again. One of the questions that we often ask as scientists is, where did all our water come from? Because when the Earth was first formed, it was hot and it was a, a, like a, a molten ball of lava. So where did the water come from? As the Earth cooled down, we got water. And the idea is that sort of um, asteroids, because um, in the early solar system, it was chaos. Things were pinging around all over the place. You know, some of the outer planets used to be closer in, and then they got gravity, um, gravity, um, gravity from other planets pulled them outwards. And so in the early solar system, there was, there was things sort of you know, zipping around all over the place. You would know, have had to duck. And so what we think is that some of these sort of, um, um, sort of uh, large rocks had quite a bit of water on them. And in the early, we call it, the, um, I think, the, um, the mass bombardment period, we think lots of these rocks hit the Earth and left water here. And that's why now four-fifths of the Earth's surface is water. And we are very much a product of the planet we live on. So we were bombarded with all these rocks. Now, the moon could have been bombarded in the same way. But the moon is much smaller, and it doesn't have this atmosphere that we have. And so if it had got water, the water would have just evaporated out into space. So if it was bombarded by similar rocks containing water, the water would have settled on the surface, but just evaporated into space, because it has no atmosphere sort of to contain it. So that's why, and it has no atmosphere, partly because it's sort of much smaller. And um, also, um, our gravitational, sorry, our magnetic field around the Earth helps us contain our, um, our atmosphere. So these are the various reasons why we don't have... Um, why the moon doesn't have water. It was probably bombarded in a similar way to Earth, but that water just evaporated into space because there was no atmosphere and not enough mass to keep it all in place. But another interesting place is Mars, because if we look at planet Mars, you know, smaller than Earth, Mars used to have water flowing over its surface. We can find sort of a river tributaries, and we can find sort of a boulders or, 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 or sort of a rocks which were uh, shaped by water. But Mars also lost its water. And that's quite interesting, because we have all this water here on Earth. Mars used to have water, but what happened to it? And so we're investigating the history of Mars to try and understand what happened. Why did the environment change so much that it lost all its water? So by looking out in the solar system, sometimes it helps us understand our planet a lot better. And that's why I love what I do. I love sort of being a scientist and investigating all these amazing different things, because it helps us understand our place here on Earth as well. Thank you for your question. <laughs> It's a bit like being Miss Marple. And <laughs> it, it is. It's a detective. It is a detective. It is, but I think that's what being a scientist is about. Yes. It's sort of detective work, cl getting the sort of the various clues, getting the evidence, mm -hmm. and trying to come up with a theory. And sometimes you come to the right conclusion, and sometimes you come to a totally different conclusion. <laughs> I've got where six, and where seven. Now I'll take if I may. Oh, two hands went up for <laughs> yeah. seven. Well, I'll take six, and then I'll take the two sevens together. If that's all right. That sounds good two to me. Sevens. Number six. So if you stand up and tell me if you're like, where are you there? Is the light on? And yes, yes, your name. My name is Sandy. Um, and does the moon have the same minerals underground as Earth, like diamonds, gold, iron, etc.? That's a very interesting question. Now, I mentioned that we think the moon was formed because you know, we had this collision with the planet Thea, and they sort of smooshed and the moon formed. One of the problems that we're finding is when we analyze rocks that we've got from the moon. So you know when the, um, the uh, Americans went to the moon, they brought back moon samples, and I've actually held one of the moon samples, it was very exciting. And when the Russians went to the moon, they brought back uh, moon samples. We've analyzed those rocks, and when we analyze them and look at the chemical composition and compare it with what we have on Earth, they are very, very similar. In fact, they're too similar. And this is one of the reasons why the theory about Thea doesn't quite add up. Because if the moon was collided, well, if Thea collided with, um, with the Earth and formed the moon, then the moon should be partly Thea and partly Earth. But what we're finding is that the composition of the moon, as you say, the minerals and the chemicals that make up the moon are very, very similar to what we find here on Earth. And so Thea doesn't quite add up. So this is why we've got a theory, but it doesn't quite, uh, the detective, we need to do some more detective work. So the answer to your question is, the moon has very, very similar chemicals to what we find here on Earth, but um, at the same time, um, that is um, a problem for us, because it means that our theory about how the moon was formed doesn't add up. 
But it's also quite interesting because if you look at the moon, um, uh, if I take this ball and say this is the moon, if I was to slice this ball in half and look at what's inside the moon and slice the Earth in half, in, uh, on, on the Earth we have a sort of an outer crust, and then uh, after that we have a sort of an area called the mantle. And then after that, we have the core, and the core is made up of two layers. One is a liquid core, which is liquid molten metal, liquid molten iron, actually. And then at the very centre of the Earth, we have um, a hard um, iron core. And it's that liquid metal core that gives us our magnetic field, that, you know, that protects us from all sorts of things out there. So um, we have a magnetic field. You know, if you have a compass and it points north, that's the magnetic field of Earth at work. So, but if you, so um, we often compare the Earth to a sort of like an egg. So um, if you crack open the egg, you've got the shell, and then you, and the, the white bit is the mantle, and then the core is the yolk in the centre. Now, if you look at the moon and crack the moon open, and the moon isn't like an egg. It's like um, a, a, a chocolate chip muffin, but it's a really boring chocolate chip muffin. So it's a boring sugar-coated chocolate chip muffin. Because if you crack the moon open, what you have is you have a nice sugar-coated uh, um, uh, outside, which is sort of uh, the crust. And then you have the mantle, which is you know, the nice cakey bit of the muffin. I like that bit. But then at the very centre, you have this tiny um, chocolate chip. So it's, a, it's a, a muffin, a chocolate chip muffin with just one chocolate chip sitting right at the centre, and that's the core of the moon. Because the core of the moon is quite small. It's iron, but it's quite small. And one of the questions we're asking is, does the core of the moon, it's iron at the centre, like the Earth is, but much, much smaller in comparison to the size of the planet, but does it have a liquid outer layer which can cause a magnetic field? We know it did in the past because we've found magnetism on the moon, but it's quite interesting to know if it's all solid now or is there still a bit of liquid metal flowing about the moon, creating a tiny, tiny magnetic field. So yes, I mean, they're very similar in composition. They're very similar in composition in terms of the chemicals they're made up of, but the inside of them is quite different because the Earth has got a much, much bigger core than the Moon has. Thank you for your question. Now, two sevens. Yeah, two sevens. What? Seven, the first seven A. Could, right, lady in the oh, yeah, red. Got, got red. Yes, lovely. Uh -huh. How come some planets have more moons than ours? Yes. Now I mean, that's the first. So what's ooh, the job? Okay. I'm trying to squeeze them in because we're getting on. Where oh, was the yes. other number seven? Stand up, please. What's your question? Um, how did the moon go further away from the Earth in time? Okay, perfect. Thank well, that's you. That's two. Okay, that's, that's two questions. So the first one is how come we've only got one moon? I know. I mean, yes, but when, I think Jupiter's got about 67. And Saturn's got about 62. Yeah, how come we only ended up with one? Well, it's part, all partly to do with gravity as well. But if you look at the planets of the inner solar system, let's start with the year. They've got the sun at the centre. Then you've got Mercury, no moons at all. Venus, no moons. Earth, just the one moon. And Mars, two moons, but they're barely moons. I mean, you know, pebble and potato. We, we, <laughs> and then you sort of go through the asteroid belt and then you get to the gas giants. Now, the gas giants are huge. So Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. And Jupiter, if I took planet Earth, I could fit 1,000 Earths into one Jupiter. That's how big Jupiter is. And when you're that big, it means that you have lots of mass, and so you can sort of attract things to you. So with Jupiter's moons, we're not too sure how they formed. One way is um, when the solar system formed, it had a sort of a huge disk around it. And we think that th sort of things in this disk sort of clump together. And Jupiter is so big, we think that Jupiter clumped together, but things around Jupiter clumped together. And so and that's how its moons formed. So I think it very much depends on the size of the planet you're talking about, and also their location in the solar system. So Mars has got two moons, but we think that they just, it, it just stole them from the asteroid belt. But then as you go further and further out, but then you saw Jupiter has um, lots of moons, Saturn has lots of moons, but then as you go further out into the ice giants, a long, long way away from the sun, you get fewer moons again. So they've still got quite a few moons, because they're quite big planets, but they do have fewer moons. So I think it depends on where you form and how, how big a gravitational mass you are to attract other things to you. So I think that's why. And although we've only got one moon, I, I have to say, unbiased, it is the best moon. <laughs> it really does help us in all sorts of different ways. So thank you. That was number uh, that was seven. And then the other question. The moon's uh, moving further. Uh, you yes. said it's spiralling. It used to be really... I was worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> because what if it goes away completely? Well, see, it's a very interesting question. And a, a few years ago, I made a documentary called Do We Really Need the Moon? And the answer is, yes, we need the moon. Ah. But, but the moon is... Now, this is a bit of a complicated idea. But um, if the... OK, let's say... Um, um, if we've got the Earth in the centre, the moon is sort of... A, a, it orbits the Earth, but it orbits the Earth in a spiral rather than and sort of just a, in a static um, ellipse. And so it's slowly but surely spiralling away from us. And um, as it does this, 
um, as the moon sort of speeds up and spirals away from us, the Earth actually slows down. So um, um, if you go back in time, a day on the early Earth when the moon was first formed was only about five hours long. So rather than taking 24 hours to go all the way around to spin on its axis, the Earth used to take just five hours. But as the moon moves further away from us, the moon speeds up, but the Earth slows down. And it's due to something called the conservation of angular momentum, which I'm not going to go into, but it's, um, it's a process that happens. And so as the Earth is slowing down, we have a 24-hour day now, but in the future, the day will slowly but surely get longer and longer and longer. Yeah. Now, now we, you have to be at school longer then. <laughs> so no That'll longer be good. <laughs> or I can see a look of <laughs> horror on your face. Now, <laughs> the problem with this is, um, I don't know, has, have you ever seen someone sort of a, have a, a netball or a baseball on their finger? They spin it up and it, goes, it, it, and it spins on their finger. They can sort of just balance it really carefully. I, I, I've tried it a few times and I just burned my finger. So I'm not very good at it. But if you do that, the problem is, as the ball starts to slow down, you might notice that the ball starts to wobble. And as the Earth starts to flow, slow down, as the days get longer and longer and longer, um, and the Earth starts to slow down, the Earth could start to wobble. And if it does this, interesting things could happen, because our seasons would go up the creek. Because at the moment, we're sort of, you know, at a tilt of about 23 degrees, and we've got you know, the solar ice cap and the polar ice caps. But um, if the Earth starts to tilt, what could happen is the ice caps could actually go to the equator. And if that happens, these ice caps will melt. And if that happens, quite a bit of the world will be submerged underwater. And so the whole world could change. Now, this isn't going to happen for about another two, three billion years. So oh. no one panic. We're OK. <laughs> I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can see sighs of relief all around. But, but as the moon moves away from us, so if we didn't have a moon, um, our days would be a lot longer. Our Earth would be a lot less stable. So this is another thing that the moon gives us. So nothing to worry about because we're safe for a long, long time. But in the future, as the moon keeps on spiraling away from us and gets further and further away, and eventually it could get far, far enough away from us that it's not really captured by the Earth's gravity and it could sort of spiral on out into space, which would be quite scary. But uh, as I say, two, three, four billion years, we haven't got anything to worry about for now. <laughs> we're covered for now. I've but got, yes. I've got eight and nine. Where's eight? Ooh. A nine? Is there a nine? No. Well, let me have one from over here. Somebody who's not asked a question. Oh, who's not asked a question we'll over see here? two questions here. Yep. I'll take eight, nine, and ten, and then Ooh, we're... Actually, I'm going to have to take a... Oh, that's my daughter. A, your daughter, <laughs> yes. So which shall we end with your question, eight, my love? Eight, nine, and we'll end up with ten. Eight, <laughs> please, where are you? Just... Right, you stand up. What's your name? Is your microphone on? Oh, did you just ask a question? Have you just <laughs> asked one. Some, who's not, if you ask one already, what somebody's not asked a question? Where are you? You're oh, up. I've got some your light, over there the light's well. on. That's it. Thank you. Um, my name. That's you. Yes. My I'm name's up. Isaac, and my question is: oh. How many moons can you fit into the Earth? How many moons can you fit into the Earth? Yeah. Well, actually, because I haven't done the calculation, but let's have a look. I want you to guess. Yeah. So this is the Earth, and this is about the size of the Moon. How many do you reckon you'd get in there? Four to six. Four to six. Oh, I think maybe a few more. Because if you think of this as a fruit bowl, um, um, this would be this could take quite a few oranges, couldn't you? And then sort of if you put the top one, that's another sort of few oranges. What would you say? Well, I'm going to ask, how many think ten? Okay. Twenty. Twenty-five. Mm. Thirty. Are we getting close yet? Well, actually, I think I think of the order of mm, I'd say for the order of 20, I think. Oh, there we are. But I think we should, you should go online and do the calculation, because if you work out the volume of the moon and work out the volume of the Earth and then divide um, the volume of the Earth by the volume of the moon, you can work out exactly how many you can switch. It. Now, that will be spheres. Um, if you do that calculation, that will be how many uh, moons you can fit into the Earth if you squish them in. But it's an interesting calculation to do. I've done it for the Sun, and I've done it for, um, I've done it for the Earth and the Sun, and I've done it for the Earth and Jupiter, but I haven't done it for the Earth and the moon, so it'll be an interesting one to find out. Lovely. Uh, so next question. Where, there was yes, right at the back. I, I got all muddled up. Where, where are you? Oh, so You're uh, pointing. Are that, oh, I can't see you. Are you standing? No, right at the back. Pigtails. Is it lady with? Is it? Yes, you. Is it you? <laughs> You're, are you? Are you standing? Sta there you are. Now I can see you. Has your light come on? There you go. Ask your question. My name is Claudia, Hello. and. 
And what makes the moon go around the Earth? Nobody's pushing it. No one's pushing it. That's a good question. <laughs> now, you see, hmm. now how can I just it? If the Earth, sorry, if the moon wasn't going around the, um, the Earth and moving, then what would happen is the moon would just get sucked into the Earth. And so, hmm, how can I describe this? Earth. If I, had, if I had a piece of string and a ball on the end, if I swing the ball around my head, um, um, if I go very fast and I cut the string, what's going to happen to the, um, to the ball? It'll go pinging off, effectively, into space. That's right, it'll go whoosh! And now, um, but um, if, um, um, because gravity is an attractive force, if the moon didn't have what we call momentum, if it wasn't travelling around the Earth, it would actually get pulled and sucked into the Earth. But we think it's about how the moon formed. We think the moon sort of hit the Earth at a glancing blow, but it had... It had sort of a momentum, it was carried. And so we think that it sort of continued, because it was captured by the Earth's gravity, and because it had um, speed or, or velocity when it first hit the Earth, we think it continued spiralling around the Earth. But it is spiralling slowly but surely away from us. So, um, because in space, um, for, say, for instance, the Earth goes around the Sun, and the Earth takes a year to go around the Sun. If things in space were static, then they would just be sucked towards um, the, um, the very large bodies around them. So the moon would be sucked towards the Earth, um, the Earth would be sucked towards the sun. But because they have this angular momentum, which is keeping them spinning around and around, it means they keep on orbiting, and they don't just get sort of sucked towards the very large um, mass that is at the centre of whatever they're orbiting. So um, that spin is very important because it um, would have a very, very different solar system if it was just all the force of gravity. Because gravity is a force that attracts things, but it's the, the, um, the velocity of these things, the speed of the things, that actually keeps them in orbit around the bodies they're going around. But a very interesting question. Thank you. <laughs> now, I've got a couple from over... I'm going to take... A, oh, yes, and there is one over there as well, which oh, would be... Well, and yes, and where, this one. <laughs> one? Well, I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I, know, I want to... Gosh, we have gone over. I'm so got, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's yourself. Um, Where's the one that I've missed? Oh, in the gap. Oh, oh, oh. Right. With a microphone. Uh, well, <laughs> wait a minute. I'm going to take. Can I take two or three at once? Yes, I think yes. That's fine. You, you have to I'm remember. I'm coming them for to me you in then. a minute. You get there. So that'll be one, two. Were you one as well? I think three, and then yourself, and that's it. Darling, I'll have to stop soon, or we'll be here till the moon <laughs> goes up. And this lady will be a lunatic and won't let us leave because she'll be taking a glass More of wine moon. looking at the moon. Maybe we should all have a glass of wine looking at the moon. Right, so question up here first, please. My, my name is Miriam, and I want to know um, who encouraged you to be a lunatic? Uh, who encouraged that? We'll keep that one to last. Okay. I think that's the. <laughs> like, who encouraged you to be a lunatic? Where's the other we'll ones? Uh, here? Yes? Is your microphone on? Let's chat there. Right here. That you are, right? Oh, golly. Pull the George a wee bit. That's it. Why is the moon's path an eclipse and not a circle around the Earth? Okay, why is it, why is it elliptical? Okay, yes, elliptical. why is it not a circle? And. For a if you're in a, a, a moon base and you're and you're growing a flower, um, would and because there's less gravity, would this affect the growth? Okay, moon base right. flowers. Um, we'll come to very very last. Okay. We'll come to your daughter Lovely. very very last. Right. Okay. So we're yes. coming. Well, we come to you second last about why. So we'll come to this one about so why doesn't it go round in a circle? Yes, well, I've learned so much. I know it's an ellipse now. Yes, yeah, an ellipse, and you want yes. to know about growing flowers, right? So it's quite interesting because um, many, if you go back, way back in time, people thought that the Earth was the centre of the solar system and that everything went around the Earth. And that makes sense because they saw the sun rise and sort of go around the Earth and set. But then people came up with new ideas. That was the helo. Oh, that was the sort of um, the, they came up with what we call the helocentric universe, which is, has the sun at the centre. And people like um, sort of Copernicus started coming up with these ideas, and they started doing the calculations. But it doesn't work if it's a circle. Now I need to be careful because an ellipse, um, a circle, is a special type of ellipse. So an ellipse um, is uh, this squash circle. And um, when you actually look at the planets going around um, um, the sun or the moon going around us, most of these, they're quite circular, but they are this squash circle. And unfortunately, the math just doesn't, doesn't add up. Um, it just, it's not a stable orbit if they're circular. Um, an ellipse is a special thing because it has... Uh, a, a circle has a, sort of a, a point of centre in the middle, and an ellipse has what we call two foci. And for it, 
for a planet to go around the sun or for the moon to go around us, it needs to be the ellipse for the mathematics to work. And it took us a long time to work this out because when people started saying that the sun was the center of the solar system, they said, okay, then the planets go around the sun in circles. And when they did the maths, it just didn't add up. And so it wasn't until they realized that it was ellipses that the uh, maths added up and we could actually predict where th various things are. And these predictions are really important to us because, for instance, we send probes out to Pluto, which is billions of miles away. And it's because we understand how the universe works and these ellipses that we're able to actually, uh, um, um, actually fly past planets like Pluto or land on Mars. So these are very important. But it turns out that in the ellipse is the stable configuration and a circle just doesn't work with the maths. So that was a discovery, but it took a while to get there. Okay, so I think the next question... The flower. The flower, yes. Now, flowers are interesting. Because have you ever... Uh, when I was at school, we did an experiment called tropisms, and I don't know if you remember this, but this is when sort of flowers grow. And if you put light on one side of the flower and not the other, the flower will bend towards. And also, um, gravity is, um, uh, actually affects the way a flower will grow. So because the gravity of the moon is fairly even, the flowers will grow but I think they might grow faster and shoot up quicker because the force of gravity is less. So it's quite interesting. Now, um, have you heard of um, Tim Peake? He's lovely. I met him once, and he's really, really very friendly. Um, he actually took rocket up to the International Space Station, and he took some seeds that went into space and left some seeds behind. Then he sent it out to schools. And so um, it was quite interesting to see if the seeds that had been in space were any different than the seeds that were stayed on Earth. I don't think they were. But, but um, if you're actually growing a plant, because of these um, tropisms, um, the ways that plants are affected by light, by gravity, and by various other things, I think the plant might grow um, sort of... It has a force to grow up, and because the gravity is less, I think it might grow up faster, so you might get taller plants. And if you, um, as, um, as a baby, if you were born on the moon and you grew up on the moon, you'd probably be taller on the moon's surface than you are here. Yeah. Because just like a plant, you'd grow up, but with less gravity, you'd probably grow taller. So um, people who live on the moon or who are born on the moon would be taller. People who live on Mars, the Martians, would be taller as well. So for the future people, if you have a baby on Mars, they're likely to be taller than you because there's less gravity pulling them down and their muscles will grow and their bones will grow and they'll shoot up. But at the same time, just as a quick aside, um, if you're living uh, on, in less gravity, then your bones suffer from something called osteoporosis. Because they're not working against Earth's gravity, mm -hmm. the um, calcium in your bones actually leaks out. And some of the early astronauts, well, uh, astronauts that go on the International Space Station, uh, people who live on the moon in the future, if they want to come back to Earth, they're going to have to do lots and lots of exercises so that they don't lose the calcium from their bones. And that's another way that space is teaching us about Earth, because people here on Earth can get osteoporosis. And by studying astronauts and seeing how the calcium comes out of their bones, we can get a better understanding of how we can help them by looking at the astronauts and what they do. Thank you very much for your question. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question over here, and that was... Um, I think that was about... Getting, oh, why? Why am I a lunatic? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I think it runs in the family because um, my father used to tell me, because he was brought up in Africa. He, comes from, he came from Nigeria. I was born here in the UK. But my father came from Africa and he used to tell me about riding his bicycle late at night because he lived 12 miles away from his school. And so he had to cycle to school and cycle home again. And sometimes when he was cycling home, it was dark and there were no street lights. So he'd be cycling across. And the moon was his friend because when the moon was up, it had more light. And so he could see where he was going. So my father always told me that the moon was his friend. So I thought the moon must be my friend. Now, I grew up in London and there's lots of street lights and you can't see the moon so well. But I still thought the moon was fantastic because it was a good enough friend for me. For my dad, it was a good enough friend for me. And my daughter is going to ask the last question. I think she's a lunatic too. Sorry, kid. <laughs> because sometimes we look at the moon and sometimes we go outside and we just howl at the moon. You know, oh, because the moon's so beautiful. So I, it might be hereditary, but it might be just indoctrination. But I think it, I got it from my father. And so my father passed it on to me and now I'm passing it on to my daughter. But what I want to do is I want to pass it on to everybody because I think it's worthwhile being a lunatic. We should all be howling at the moon. <laughs> so thank you very much for, my, for your question. And, and now your daughter. Yeah, yes. and then finally, leading on to you. Are, are spacesuits soft? Are, are spacesuits soft? That's a very interesting question. So, and actually, th this wasn't, I didn't know this was coming, honest. <laughs> are spacesuits, the, the spacesuits they took onto the moon were quite hard and rigid. And most spacesuits that they use are, are quite hard and rigid. But, and it depends on the environment that you're in. 
So on the moon's surface, and because of the temperature ranges and because of the very, very extreme um, um, environment, the, the spacesuits are quite rigid and they're articulated in various places. So it's a bit like one of your uh, Barbie dolls, you know, some of them have got arms that move <laughs> and the elbows can move and things like that. So, um, uh, uh, but if you had a spacesuit for somewhere like Mars, Mars is a bit of an atmosphere, it hasn't got such a, quite a, such a big temperature range. So the, the spacesuits they're designing for a planet like Mars could be a lot more flexible and uh, sort of a less rigid and less, because they have to do less protection. So I think the spacesuit is very much a product of um, the planet you're on, or, or the moon you're on, or wherever you are. So um, uh, I think that's a, it's, it's like dressing. You know, um, um, when we flew up here, it was really warm, and so we sort of, you know, were wearing summer dresses. Now it's got a bit colder, we've got our winter coats out. It depends on your environment, the way you dress. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I, can I say uh, fascinating, we could sit here all afternoon, it was cool, and super questions from you all, really Fantastic. great questions from right round. So big round of applause here, because oh. that was really excellent. Oh, thank you. And, and I know you've got copies of your book downstairs at the, yes. at the sh outside the shop where you'll be signing them. I yes. hope there's a queue there because I'm learned, I'm coming. <laughs> I, I really learned an awful lot about the moon. I just felt like doing a moon yowl. Who would like to do a moon oh, yeah, yowl? Let's, let's. How do you do it? You show us how to do it. Right, ready? <laughs> one, two, three. Okay, so we're going to do a howl. Okay, right? so yeah. One, two, two three. three. Oh! oh! We're all, we're all lunatics. We're all lunatics now. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> thank you for your questions. Enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>